Today, banking regulators are expected to release new guidelines for how regional banks should prepare for their own demise. It's an area that's gotten more attention since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank earlier this year. And joining us right now to talk about the, the bank's new living wills and what the government hopes to accomplish with them is Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Director and FDIC board member Rohit Chopra. Uh, Rohit, thank you, first of all, for being here this morning. It, it, it gets pretty confusing when you start talking about living wills for banks. In a nutshell, what, what should we expect? What will these rules be designed to do? Well, we all know that when big banks are on the precipice of failure, they can pose consequences for the entire system and the economy. But I think what came into closer view this March, it's even those large banks that are just operating domestically. Many people hadn't even heard of Signature, Silicon Valley, First Republic, but they too can pose some serious risks. And the truth is the playbook uh, to deal with their failures can be pretty thin. It's often try and find a bigger buyer. So what we are looking at is whether there should be more rules to figure out and give more time to the FDIC on how to wind them down or how to recapitalize them or break them into pieces for sale because time is often of the essence. So we're looking at better living wills, just like the biggest banks have to, as well as some long-term debt requirements to give us more time in the event of a failure. I mean, that makes an awful lot of sense, especially on the face of it. You, you do need more time. These things always seem to happen over a weekend where you have to immediately look around and find a buyer. But that might just be the nature of bank failures. Um, understandably, you want the cushion of being able to say, OK, if this happens, we've got the cash cushion because these banks have set aside their own money. So you're not going to taxpayers. You're not going to the FDIC, which by the way, is just the banks themselves covering to pay for that when you tap into FDIC money. The unintended consequence may be, though, that it means all of these banks have less money for, for lending. And that's happening at a time that's pretty um, unfortunate in the cycle of where banking is at the moment. If you have less money available for loans to small businesses, if you have less money available for uh, commercial real estate loans, which commercial real estate could be in trouble at the moment. All of those things mean that there's going to be less money available, and that could really put a pinch on, on the economy overall, on what businesses can do, even what some Americans, uh, individuals, will be able to do as a result. How do you counteract between those two uh, situations? Well, you know, when credit is also not available, when there is contagion and a financial crisis, I think investors on Wall Street know that big bank failures can quickly have a cascade on the rest of the economy. So it's important to protect consumers and small businesses and those who really depend on that daily credit that we, one, minimize the chance of these big failures, but also, like you said, when they do occur, that there is a little bit more time. We've looked at a lot of data on this, and the truth is there's a lot of lessons from the mortgage crisis, a lot of lessons from Washington Mutual, IndyMac, and including Silicon Valley Bank. And it's very important we learn from those lessons and prevent some of these failures and the effects that they can have on the whole economy. Okay. And, and uh, the word back from the banks, are they kind of going along with this, or is there pushback that you've seen? Well, look, there's no bank that really wants to hold more capital or wants to do planning for their own demise. But banking is too important to our country and our economy. And you know, this is using government insured funds and there's a lot of public privileges they get and that has to come um, with some real safeguards on the other side. We can't be in a situation where Main Street and small businesses and households uh, become the victims of you know, excessive risk-taking and poor management. Let me just ask you very quickly about junk fees while we have you here. It's been a battle that the uh, consumer, the CFPB, has taken up and is ready to go on. Um, it's hard to imagine anybody taking the side of junk fees, saying, yeah, these are good, we want to defend these things. But the push has come that it may not be within your purview. W what's happening in that fight? Well, it's, it's directly when it comes to overdraft fees and 
credit card fees and so much more. I think here's what we're seeing sometimes across the economy. Rather than be very clear and upfront with the price, there's a lot of stuff stuck at the end. We see it when we buy a concert ticket, when we book a hotel. And if you want a real competitive market, you should put the price up front. I think that's a bedrock of, of, of free markets and capitalism, too. Already, the CFPB's work has really gotten rid of billions of junk fees. We've taken Wells Fargo and Regions Bank and others to task for their own illegal junk fees, and we're going to keep doing it.